Hi everyone, um, we've been having some connectivity issues and we're not sure on which end this is. Can everyone hear me and see both of us? Could, if, if you can hear me and see us, can somebody type yes, please? In the... No, I don't know. Victor, can you... Yes, okay. Yes. Um, Get, Victor, can you say something? Hi, can everyone hear? Can people me? hear Victor? Now you have to May say yes to Victor. You you hear both of us? Okay, it seems it seems to be working because I can't hear him, which is which is annoying. But if you guys can hear him, then then it's perfectly fine. Um, okay, so it's really a great pleasure to. Um, to have the opportunity to host Victor for the Worldwide Neuro uh, Seminar. So Victor did a, a postdoc with, um, with Ed Calloway. Um, hang on one second, what's going on here? At the Salk Institute um, and has then uh, returned to Spain to be a group leader at the Neuroscience Institute in Alicante. Um, he's the holder or was the holder of an ERC consolidator grant. He's been for a couple of years now the, the uh, deputy director of the institute um, and ha has done some really, really nice work on, uh, on uh, brain evolution, cortical neurogenesis. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to cite a couple of what I think is, is uh, or two or three of his really uh, important contributions um, to the field. First is Victor was one of the first to uh, sort of establish the ferret model uh, to study cortical uh, neurogenesis, um, brain development in general. Um, and he is one of the co-discoverers of this sort of super important subtype of neuroprogenitor cells um, that seem to be primate specific or at least super enriched in primates and, and maybe um, hold a, a key to a number of observations, including uh, cortical expansion, but also cortical, cortical vulnerability to certain viral infections or uh, microcephaly mutations. These are the famous basal or outer radial glia, depending on what, you, what nomenclature you prefer. So Victor was ac actually one of the people who discovered these cells. He had this beautiful piece of work on uh, the role of the switch uh, between indirect and direct neurogenesis in regulating uh, brain size evolution uh, in, in different species um, a few years ago. So, so he's really done some, some really key, uh, uh, key work and made key observations uh, to the field. Um, so it's a uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Victor. It's uh, all up to you now. You can share your screen and start the talk whenever you're ready. Basem, can you hear me? Okay, I guess he doesn't hear me. He should have said something else that then he asked him, but that's fine. Let me share my screen, and uh, let's hope that you all that you all can see. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, I'm. I'm hoping yes. Um, so I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm going to get started. So first, I want to uh, thank Basem for uh, the nice words of introduction. And of course, I want to thank the organizers of this fantastic forum for putting it together, and uh, especially, obviously, to uh, uh, make me uh, be part of it. So as uh, you all know, uh, during um, amniote evolution, there have been dramatic uh, changes in, in the brains of uh, the multiple species. And these uh, changes or differences have to do mostly with uh, a dramatic increase in brain size, which is uh, mostly related to an increase in the size of the cerebral cortex. And then uh, more recently in mammals, there have been mechanisms leading to the folding of the cerebral cortex combined with uh, an even greater expansion of its size. Now, over the uh, following uh, 45 to 50 minutes, I will present you um, arguments in support of the idea that this expansion in size and folding of the cerebral cortex across evolution is the result of the regulation of the levels and patterns of expression 
of genes and signaling pathways that are otherwise conserved across amniote um, phylogeny. So regarding the differences in cortex size, I think it's quite evident that these are primarily caused by differences in the amounts of neurons. So that is to say in the rates of neurogenesis, the degree of neurogenesis. Of course, there's other parameters that are influencing brain size or cortex size, which include the size of neurons or the density of these neurons. And these may be particularly important for the size of the avian brain. But in general, um, we all agree, I guess, that neurogenesis plays a key part in, the, in this expansion of the cortex. Now in the embryonic cortex, the primary type of progenitor cells are radial glial cells. Uh, these have their cell body located in the primary germinal zone, the ventricular zone, the express pac 6 and these are cells that are uh, very much polarized. They extend a thin process across the thickness of the cortex to the surface uh, of, the, of the outer cortex, and these cells um, undergo apical division. Now, these are the primary uh, uh, neural stem cells to produce neurons in the cortex, and they do so in uh, largely two different ways. On the one hand, uh, upon division from these radial glial cells, uh, neurons are born directly, and afterwards they use this radial fiber actually to migrate to the surface of the cortex where they differentiate, and this is the process that we call direct neurogenesis. And alternatively, these radial glial cells uh, may produce intermediate progenitor cells. These are uh, uh, a new kind of progenitors that will um, form a secondary germinal layer, the subventricular zone, where they will perform basal divisions. And from these divisions, additionally, a new neurons will be born, which again will resume migration and differentiate in the surface of the cortex. And this is a process that we call indirect neurogenesis. Now, from a purely uh, you know, hypothetical uh, perspective, uh, if we had uh, two progenitors, one undergoing only direct neurogenesis and another one going uh, only indirect neurogenesis. We give them the same amount of developmental time and the same number of rounds of cell division. What's going to happen is that progenitors going uh, undergoing direct neurogenesis will produce a relatively small amount of neurons. So if this happens in the cortex, uh, they will generate a relatively small cortex. Now, in the case of indirect neurogenesis, What's going to happen is that this progenitor will undergo some self-amplification, then produce the intermediate progenitors, and in the end will be capable of producing a much larger number of neurons, hence a much larger cortex. And even if we extend developmental time, of course, the number of neurons will be much, much greater, and the cortex that can be built, again, will also be much greater. So we considered the possibility, or we're intrigued about understanding uh, whether these are uh, really mechanisms prevailing in those species with a small cortex like reptiles, and this indirect neurogenesis really is prevailing in, in these other species with a bigger cortex, and whether there was a switch during evolution from the uh, mode of direct neurogenesis gradually into modes of indirect neurogenesis from these radial glial cells. And this was a process, uh, uh, sorry, a project that was developed by a really amazing PhD student in my laboratory, Adrian Cardenas. So Adrian the, decided to study this question, uh, first of all, in the mouse, where um, he would be comparing the development of the olfactory bulb with that of the neocortex. And there's uh, various reasons for that. One is that the olfactory bulb is part of the paleocortex, which is the ancient cortex. And in the olfactory system uh, was the first system to be developed in the, in the cortex and, and part of the olfactory bulb. So it's one of the most ancient systems in the, in the dorsal tail encephalon to be developed. And so what Adrian did, was to um, uh, look at the early development of this olfactory bulb, and he decided to focus in the earliest stage where one can distinguish or, or find some differences between the primordium of the olfactory bulb and the primordium of the neocortex, which is about this embryonic time in the mouse. So the first thing that Adrian identified was a, a very dramatic difference in the abundance of neurons that we find in the primordium of the olfactory bulb, labeled with these markers, as compared to the neocortex. Now, because from the literature, we knew that the majority of cortical neurons are produced by indirect neurogenesis, uh, we expected that this difference might be due because in the olfactory bulb, there is a lot more of these intermediate progenitors. So that's what Adrian started looking for, cells expressing this marker and undergoing basal mitosis. But to our surprise, what he found is that, in fact, in the olfactory bulb, there is fewer of these intermediate progenitors and fewer of those basal mitosis. Now, obviously, this contradicts what uh, we were looking for or were hoping that we would find. And so it led us to think that maybe this excess of neurons in the primordium of the olfactory bulb 
might be generated in the alternative mechanism with this diagonal genesis. Now, if this was the case, uh, one way to look at this would be to look for uh, neurons recently born from this apical mitosis here in the ventricular zone to see if we would find them. And in fact, that's exactly what Adrian found, that uh, uh, he looked for neurons labeled with TBR1 within the ventricular zone, and he found a much greater number of these neurons in the olfactory bulb than in the adjacent neocortex, indicating that there was a high incidence of direct neurogenesis in this olfactory bulb primordium. He uh, provided additional arguments to defend this idea, including, for example, time-lapse imaging, where he found that uh, mitosis of radio glial cells, by looking at these movies, uh, the number of those mitoses that would produce neurons was much greater in the olfactory bulb than in the neocortex. So in summary, indeed, uh, there is a very clear distinction between the olfactory bulb and the cortex, which is that there is a higher incidence of the regenesis in the olfactory bulb. So the next question was, how is this molecularly regulated? And we decided to focus on robot receptors. These are transmembrane receptor proteins, uh, famous for being important in axon guidance, but we found them both robo one and robo two to be highly expressed in the germinal cells of the primordium of the olfactory bulb, as you can see here, especially in comparison to the progenitor cells in the neocortex. Consistent with the, with the idea that maybe robo one and two might be important in uh, establishing or driving this direct neurogenesis. So we looked at the uh, double mutants for Robo1 and Robo2, and what we found was that the abundance of these neurons in the primordium of the olfactory bulb was much larger in the wild type, much less in the mutant. And what Adrian could also see was that the rate of cell cycle ex exit, which means the rate at which progenitors are producing neurons, is much lower in the olfactory bulb of the mutants as compared to the wild type. And there again, the frequency of those neurons found in the ventricular zone was much lower in the olfactory bulb of these mutants as compared to wild types, indicating then that drop receptors are important and are uh, essential for the formation of this direct neurogenesis in the olfactory bulb. Then to understand what would be the downstream signaling of a uh, robot to drive direct neurogenesis, we started uh, looking at uh, the expression patterns of uh, genes belonging to the classical pathways that signal uh, and determine the fate of progenitor cells. And we found something interesting uh, with Delta-1, which is one of the canonical ligands of Notch in the Notch pathway. And this observation was that in the primordium of the olfactory bulb, there was a lot lower expression levels of uh, Delta-1 as compared to the adjacent neocortex, as you can also see here. And this then suggested that maybe these low levels of Delta-1 were important for this region to be able to uh, undergo direct neurogenesis. And interestingly, when we compared to robo-1 and two double mutants, we found that the levels of expression of robo here in the primordium of the olfactory bulb uh, were no different than in the neocortex, consistent that maybe the uh, um, low levels of delta here are indeed important to drive direct neurogenesis, which is impaired in these mutants. So then we decided to test whether these uh, levels of robo and delta in the primordium of the olfactory bulb are important in driving direct neurogenesis. And what Adrian did was to uh, go back to wild type embryos, and he performed in uterine electroporation of this uh, little rostral part of the uh, telencephalon of these embryos. And to begin with, he caused a loss of function for robo expressing dominant negative forms of robo 1 and 2. And as you can see here, this caused uh, the reduction to half of the frequency of the regular genesis taking place in the primordium of the olfactory bulb. Now, to test whether low levels of delta were important, what he did was to overexpress delta in here. And that, as we can see, also uh, reduced the rate of the regular genesis, although the difference was not as dramatic as when he caused the loss of function for robo. Uh, interestingly, when he combined both the overexpression of delta and uh, loss of function of robo, that's where he uh, obtained the most dramatic uh, decrease in the regular genesis, virtually at the same level or similar level as in the neocortex. So indicating that it is both uh, the signaling by robo and delta one that is important in directing um, uh, direct neurogenesis. Now, obviously this then led us to um, fantasize with the idea that maybe we could force direct neurogenesis in the neocortex by expressing or activating robo signaling and reducing delta. So Adrian did that again by electroporation. Um, however, when he caused a, a gain of function of robo with these methylated forms uh, or eliminated um, delta-1 by CRISPR-Cas9 uh, editing. Uh, 
This led to a you know, very, very small, if any, change in the regular genesis. However, and very interestingly, when he combined the loss of function of delta and the gain of function of robo, that was sufficient to uh, double the frequency of occurrence of the regular genesis in the cortex, which is obviously was a very important finding because it uh, showed us that the same signaling pathway and robo and delta uh, drives the regular genesis both in the olfactory world as well as in the neocortex. Of course, our initial interest was to identify whether this uh, is something that occurred during evolution. And now we were seeing that in, in different regions of the mammalian telencephalon that have different um, evolutionary histories, really there is a switch between direct and indirect neurogenesis. But we wanted to see in real, uh, real animals that have a different uh, evolutionary history. So we decided to analyze the same parameters in two non-mammals. And basically we looked for those that would be more distantly related in phylogeny, which would be the chick as a representative of birds and the snake. So when we, what we found when we analyzed the embryonic uh, development of the uh, dorsal pallium or the neocortex or the cerebral cortex of these um, embryos, we found that in the chick, uh, we could actually distinguish two parts in the dorsal pallium. One more medial part where we would see very few basal mitosis and a high abundance of neurons in the ventricular zone, indicating that there was direct neurogenesis and a more lateral part where we would see a nice number of, of those basal mitosis for intermediate progenitors and much lower numbers of neurons in the ventricular zone, uh, indicative of indirect neurogenesis in this lateral part. Now in the snake embryos, we found absolutely no presence of basal mitosis and a very large number of neurons um, here in the ventricular zone, indicating that direct neurogenesis is the only mode in these reptiles. Now, when we looked at the expression pattern for robo and delta, we found that this uh, level of expression of these two genes was again consistent and coherent with our previous uh, identifications in the mouse, where those regions undergoing direct neurogenesis would have high levels of expression of robo and low levels of expression of delta, whereas this uh, lateral dorsal pallium in the chick with having uh, indirect neurogenesis would have low levels of expression of robo and high of delta. Now, when we perform um, gain and loss of function experiments combining uh, the manipulation of robo and delta, uh, we could uh, definitely uh, demonstrate that the relative uh, expression levels of these two genes are necessary and sufficient to regulate the balance between a predominant direct neurogenesis or predominant indirect neurogenesis according to, to the relative levels of expression. We also perform uh, similar manipulations in the snake embryo. However, in this case, because there is only direct neurogenesis, and high uh, robo low delta, we only perform the opposite uh, manipulation. So we reduced robo with the dominant negatives and we overexpressed delta one. And amazingly enough, this was sufficient not only to reduce down to half the levels of the regular genesis, but also it was sufficient to induce the formation of these uh, nice basal mitosis that are aligned in the basal side of the ventricular zone exactly where one finds the subventricular zone in mammals, as you can see also here quantified. Now, what's quite amazing about this is that we were observing the formation of uh, something like a neo-germinal layer, the subventricular zone, which is actually something uh, nearly unique in mammals and definitely much more expanded in mammals, uh, although we see some uh, uh, early occurrence in the chick. Now, very importantly, when we induced indirect neurogenesis in the chick dorsal pallium, we could assess by clonal analysis that this would uh, generate much greater amount of neurons at the clonal level, indicating that not only we are uh, uh, forcing the appearance of basal progenitors, but also the amount of neurons being produced is much larger than in the control situation with this direct neurogenesis. So essentially, with this, what we demonstrated is that uh, during evolution, there was a gradual uh, change in the expression levels of both uh, robo -pro uh, robogenes and delta-1, going from uh, this situation in reptiles that uh, leads to direct neurogenesis and a limited amount of neurons being produced to gradually having less robo and more delta, which allows the formation of basal progenitors, uh, the predominance of indirect neurogenesis, and thus the generation of much greater amounts of cortical uh, neurons and then a much bigger cortex. Now, obviously, this has uh, since then uh, uh, taken us to the following question, which is whether these progenitors undergoing indirect neurogenesis and those undergoing direct neurogenesis are actually the same progenitor or uh, they're completely separate uh, populations. So in other words, whether it is one type of progenitor that can exchange uh, for some uh, yet unknown mechanism uh, 
to perform direct neurogenesis or indirect neurogenesis, or whether we're actually talking about two completely different types of progenitor cells, each one producing a different type of neurogenesis. To solve this question, we have uh, obviously gone to uh, single cell analysis, and this has been the effort of two really fantastic PhD students in my lab, Lucia Del Valle and Salma Amin, who set up uh, single cell analysis in our laboratory. And in a nutshell, and this is very much work in progress, but what we are seeing is that in the uh, neocortex of the mouse, these are uh, the same ages that we've been analyzing before, we find a cluster of radial glial cells that we call indirect radial glial cells that follow a lineage uh, uh, filled up with uh, different clusters of intermediate progenitor cells and ended with uh, a variety of clusters of, of neurons. Now in the olfactory world, we find an enrichment in another different uh, cluster of radial glial cells, which we call direct uh, radial glial cells, which follow a completely different and separate lineage that goes directly into neurons without having intermediate progenitor cells in between. And I hope that maybe with this movie, you can also distinguish very clearly these two lineages. So this somehow supports the existence of at least two populations of radial glial cells, one clearly leading to uh, direct and one to indirect neurogenesis. But I think there are still lots of uh, more work to do to really demonstrate whether these are completely separate and irreversibly separate populations of radial glial cells, or uh, uh, there's still some uh, possibility for exchange between them. Okay. So once we have uh, understood a little bit more the question of how the overall size of the cortex increased during amniote evolution, the next change that occurred during evolution was this uh, more massive expansion and uh, formation of folds of the cortex. And over the next few minutes, I'm gonna uh, show you some of the discoveries that we've made that tell us that uh, cortex folding uh, resulted during evolution from the emergence of new germinal zones and new germinal cells, as Basem uh, already started introducing. And this all started with a seminal observation from the lab of Colette de Hay in Lyon, where uh, they were studying the embryonic cortex of macaques, and they identified that the subventricular zone that in mice is relatively thin and has a not so great number of intermediate progenitor cells. Actually, in the macaque embryos, this was a massively enlarged uh, subventricular zone filled with uh, huge amounts of progenitors, and actually they could further distinguish sublayers within the subventricular zone, so they could distinguish an outer zone, an outer subventricular zone, and an inner domain or inner subventricular zone. In their description, they argued that because uh, only in primates, at the time only in macaques, they had observed this uh, outer subventricular zone, that this might be a, a germinal layer specific to primates and might be uh, particularly important for the expansion of the cortex in its size. However, we also um, uh, took this message in, in maybe proposing that this outer subventricular zone might be important additionally into the formation of folds in these primates, as uh, mice with a smooth cortex don't have an outer subventricular zone. So this was work of Isabel Reillo, former PhD student in my lab, uh, with whom we decided to analyze the embryonic cortex of a variety of species, including some with uh, folds and some without folds, and we looked for uh, the presence of the distinct germinal layers. And indeed, Isabel found a uh, clearly distinct outer subventricular zone in these four different species uh, that included obviously primates, but also ungulated carnivores, um, uh, that they all had in common, they had uh, falls in the cortex, and we did not find an outer subventricular zone in the smooth cortex species. Further suggesting of maybe the importance of this outer subventricular zone in folding of the cortex. And indeed, another piece of evidence in support of this idea is that Isabel counted uh, and uh, realized that the proportion of cortical progenitors that fall within the outer subventricular zone is directly and exponentially proportional to the degree of folding of these cortices, regardless of their absolute size. Again, supporting the idea that uh, the outer subventricular zone is an important layer for folding of the cortex. Now, we were uh, then next interested in what is the identity and wh what, what types of progenitor cells we find here in the outer subventricular zone. So for this, we work mostly in the ferret, performing uh, retroviral injections to label progenitor cells dividing there. And this is how we uh, came across a new type of progenitor cell that we call basal radial glial cells, uh, because they are actually morphologically very uh, similar to apical radial glial cells that I described before except that these apical radial glial cells, they have their cell body in the ventricular zone, and then they extend this long radial process to the cortical surface. In the case of basal radial glial cells, they have their cell body in the outer subventricular zone, also in the inner subventricular zone, uh, 
uh, and they also have this uh, radial process extended to the cortical surface. Now, in this study, we presented evidence supporting a model where these basal radioglia that are abundant in the outer subventricular zone and extend these basal processes to the cortical surface, they impose a divergent trajectory on the radial processes of the apical radioglia that have their cell bodies here in the ventricular zone. Now, because now these basal processes have these divergent trajectories, the neurons that are born in these deep germinal layers and need to use these fibers for their radial migration, they're going to be following, again, divergent trajectories in the radial migration. So then all the neurons born here will be uh, getting separated in the tangential axis uh, from each other, and so they will be, in the end, expanding this locally, the surface area of the cortex, and forming these gyres right here. Now, importantly, there is, this is regionalized, so there's parts of the cortex that have much fewer of those basal radiaglia cells like here, and so because then there is no divergence of radial fibers, and there is no separation of migrating neurons, this region will not expand and remain as a sulcus. In collaboration with Magdalena Goetz, we uh, uh, re-evaluated the abundance uh, of basal radioglia cells in, uh, in these three species, and we could see that there was a very nice correlation between the relative abundance of basal radioglia cells in the embryonic cortex with the degree of folding of this cortex. And as you can see, uh, this correlation is very nice and independent of the clade. We have the marmoset as a primate, but rather a smooth cortex, and then we have a carnivore and an ungulate, and, and this still holds. And then in collaboration with uh, Federico Calegari in Dresden, we could see that also if we force the overproliferation of these outer subventricular zone progenitor cells, that would lead to an expansion in the surface of the cortex and the formation of these additional folds. Now, one important uh, aspect of this model is that uh, we're proposing that neurons that undergo radial migration, then they will be able to switch between radial fibers so that they disperse tangentially in the surface of the cortex. And now this uh, looks very nice, but it poses an important question, which is how are neurons able to really switch from one radial fiber to another, as it, it is classically being described that these cells uh, need to use these fibers as their substrate for migration. And this is a question that uh, we studied in my lab, Marian Martinez and Alex Espinoz, in collaboration with Gabriele Cicceri from the lab of Oscar Marin. And so what we did was to first look at the detailed morphology of these migrating neurons, and we found the typical or classical or almost dogmatic morphology of these migrating neurons, which is uh, a cells that have an elongated cell body and a leading process that is completely linear and then a short trailing process. However, we also found a number of cases where these migrating neurons would have this other morphology with uh, a, a little branch in the leading process. And sometimes branches would be only one, but other times would be two branches, three and even four branches. And so there was something really different than what had been described so far. And in fact, this was not a minor thing. In the mouse, we found that, yes, the majority of cells, almost 60%, uh, are like this, like the classical descriptions, but the remaining 40% actually did have a single branch in their, in their process. Now, in the case of the ferret, this uh, was even more dramatic, which, again, uh, more than 50% of the cells did not have a branch, but uh, then about 30% of the cells had one branch, and the remaining had even more of these branches. So the degree of branching was different, and it was more in the case of this uh, animal that had uh, a folded cortex. Now also we uh, wondered whether this uh, leading process, branch or not, would be parallel to, to the radial fiber scaffold because that's supposed to be the route for migration of these cells and this uh, leading process was always shown to be intimately uh, associated to the radial fibers. So we estimated the proportion of the length of radial fiber that is actually parallel to the radial fiber scaffold. Uh, and we found that these leading processes would uh, be less parallel to the radial fiber scaffold in those cells with several branches in their leading process, suggesting that maybe these branches that are not parallel to the radial fibers might be important in, in, for these cells to be able to bridge or jump across uh, multiple radial fibers. So to look at that, we uh, perform time-lapse imaging. And you're going to see in this movie on the left uh, two cells, one labeled with a, a green arrowhead and another one with a red arrowhead. And you will see that they will migrate uh, largely in a, in a linear trajectory and they have essentially no branch or maybe at some point they will have uh, one branch uh, that is quite parallel to the general migration trajectory. You can see here the green cell migrating linearly and also the red cell migrating linearly and not establishing uh, branches. 
But I'm sure you also realized about this blue cell here. And what this blue cell is doing is, um, sorry, is uh, making a nice number of branches. And at some point is making this very wide angle branch, which the soma then decides to take and use this side branch as a, a new leading process with which it translocates laterally and then it makes yet another branch orthogonal to the direction of migration and chooses that orthogonal branch to resume radial migration, as you can see here. OK, so it turns out then that this uh, cell uh, labeled in blue here is using these uh, side branches made in the, in the leading process to actually jump across in the tangential domain uh, into new radial fibers. So uh, with this, uh, we think that maybe the model is more complete into that um, indeed there is tangential uh, distribution of these radially migrating neurons. And these neurons can actually do that because they form branches in their leading process and they use those branches not only to uh, maybe explore the environment, but most importantly, to uh, mechanically uh, and physically jump from radial fibers uh, so they can uh, move laterally. Now, one of the most uh, fascinating things about cortex folds uh, beyond that they actually form is uh, that they usually form in very stereotypic patterns. This is not very obvious in brains with a very uh, complicated patterns of folding, like in the human brain, but it's uh, very clear really when we look at other species with simpler patterns. And uh, for example, if we compare the pattern of folding in these four species, uh, they're all in, from the same clay, they're all four um, carnivores, we can see that the mink having the uh, simplest pattern of folds uh, seems to have the basic pattern. And because in the other species, what we see is that they are just adding uh, extra levels of complication, of complexity. They are adding additional folds and fissures into the basic pattern labeled here in black coming from the simplest, which is the mink. So this uh, extraordinary conservation in the pattern of folds, conservation to a certain degree, uh, across these uh, phylogenetically related species suggests strongly that there may be uh, some genetic basis onto the establishment of this pattern of folds. And so this is the question that we decided to study uh, whether and what would be the genetic um, um, mechanism into establishing these patterns of folds. And so for that, we focused again on our ferrets and we decided to focus our attention on this occipital part of the cortex where we find the spleen and gyrus and the lateral sulcus. Because indeed, in a previous study, we had shown that uh, before this gyrus and sulcus form, we see a very dramatic accumulation of cycling progenitors in the prospective gyrus as compared to the prospective sulcus, which has a lot less of those progenitors. And definitely, we know that regulation of the cell cycle and proliferation are uh, genetically determined. So for sure, we would uh, find at least some genes that should be expressed differently in these two regions. So this was a project uh, uh, performed by Camino de Juan, a postdoc in the lab, which what she did was uh, heroically uh, microdissect the three different germinal layers in these newborn ferrets where she actually would distinguish between the lateral sulcus and the prospective splenal gyrus, and then extract RNA and perform a transcriptomic comparison. And this we performed in collaboration with Carl Bruder when he, uh, when he was at Karolinska. And indeed, as you can see here, we found a very large number of genes that were differentially expressed between the sulcus and the gyrus. And this would be differentially expressed uh, in um, some, in all three germinal layers. And, and particularly in the outer subventricular zone is where we found the greatest number of genes. Now, interestingly, when we examine what are the expression patterns of these genes that we observe transcriptomically to be differentially expressed between these two regions, we uh, found pictures like this, which I think is quite remarkable how we see here a small domain of cortex with very high levels of expression of this gene, and then immediately adjacent to it, this other domain with much lower expression levels. And in fact, when we uh, look at a bunch of these genes that uh, came up from our uh, differential expression analysis, I'm just showing you here five genes. Systematically, we would see when comparing these two regions, a domain with high expression and low expression, for example, in the outer subventricular zone, as I'm showing you in these examples, and this is quantified here. Um, other cases, we would find no difference in the OSVC, but for example, in the ventricular zone and inner subventricular zone, we would find uh, much higher expression in this domain than in this other domain. Suggesting that maybe these differences in expression uh, levels, these uh, modules, uh, or modular patterns of expression might be important in, in defining the pattern of folds. And in support of this idea, we uh, further examined the expression pattern of these same genes, but in the mouse embryo, and this is data from the Allen Institute, 
And we found that in this case, the situation was completely different. The same genes were either expressed in a completely homogeneous pattern across the entire cortex, or at most they were expressed in, in shallow gradients spanning the entire rostral extent of the cortex. But there was nothing like these stepwise modular patterns that we were observing in the ferret. And suggesting that uh, the existence of these modular patterns are important for folding of the cortex, because in species that don't have these modular patterns, they have a smooth cortex. In fact, for some of these genes, we could actually map into two-dimensional uh, um, space of the cortical surface. We could map the location of those territories with high expression of, in this case, TBR2, and territories with low expression. And we could see that these were very nicely and actually amazingly well correlated with the location of the already emerging gyrus and sulcus in the cortex of these uh, young ferrets. Uh, for the supporting that uh, some of these genes that are expressed in these modular patterns uh, really define a genetic protomap of what eventually will be the pattern of cortex folding in the brains of these ferrets. Now, very importantly, uh, among the genes that we found differentially expressed in the ferret between gyrus and sulcus, uh, these included a large number of genes that are known to be mutated in human cortical malformations. In fact, 81% of the genes that have been identified as causative of human malformations were actually found in this differential expression analysis. And this included genes uh, that, whose mutation is causative of microcephaly or polymicrogyrial encephaly or uh, greater aberrations like uh, teratophoric dysplasia. And also very interestingly, when we analyze the expression pattern of some of these genes in the human embryo, in the normal or, or controlled human embryo, we found, again, these uh, patterns alternating uh, domains of high and low expression levels at really uh, uh, close vicinity and uh, establishing really complex patterns of expression, as you can see here. Again, supporting then the notion that these uh, modular patterns of gene expression are important to establish the patterns of cortex folding. At the mechanistic level, we tested uh, the function of uh, at least a couple of these genes in collaboration with other labs. And in this case, Camino examined the expression uh, levels of TRIP1, which were high uh, here in the ventricular zone of the sulcus, and they were low in the gyrus. And uh, so in this case, we collaborated with Ronnie Stoll and Magdalena Goetz, that they were very interested in understanding the role of TRIP1 in cortex development. And uh, we found that when they performed the loss of function of TRIP1 acutely and locally here, only in this little domain of the mouse cortex, the remaining having high levels of TRIP1, this was sufficient to cause folding of this mouse cortex. And then also in collaboration with Danny Del Toro and Rudiger Klein, who are interested in FLIRTS 1 and 3, Anna Villalba in my lab um, also determined that in the developing ferret, FLIRT 1 and FLIRT 3 were expressed at much lower levels in the prospective sulcus than in the gyrus. And when Danny analyzed the phenotype of FLIRT 1 and 3 mutants, which actually have a, uh, a compound phenotype, what they found is that indeed the cortex also formed falls in fissures in these uh, mutant mice. Now, this again has led us in, in more recent times into asking ourselves, how is this uh, genetic protomap established at the cellular level? So one possibility is that maybe the uh, types of progenitor cells that we have in the gyrus and the sulcus are different. And because they are different types, they have different uh, transcriptional landscapes that will lead to the occurrence of these differences between gyrus and sulcus. Now, a second possibility is that maybe we do not have different types, we have the same cell types, but maybe they are present in different frequencies. And that will also explain the differences in transcriptional landscape. Or alternatively, uh, we may have the same cell types in the same frequency, but maybe a particular subset of genes are expressed at different levels in one region versus the other. Now to address this question, again, we have turned to single cell RNA sequencing in this case uh, of the ferret. And this is very much ongoing work uh, uh, thanks to the heroic effort of Lucia del Valle, a really outstanding student in our lab, who has set up the uh, analysis pipeline uh, in the ferret genome for this single cell RNA seq data uh, with a, a very nice support of uh, Raul Satija and his lab in New York. And because we know that in the ferret uh, and in this big brain species, the outer subventricular zone is particularly important for folding, and both the outer subventricular zone and the ventricular zone is where we found the most clearly delineated uh, genetic protomaps, we decided to dissect separately, individually, each of these two layers uh, to perform the single cell analysis, and also to micro-dissect, again, separately, 
the prospective sulcus from the prospective gyrus so we could identify which of these different possibilities um, uh, are occurring in the developing fab. So this is the result that we have gotten so far. This is our, our collection of cells, again, from uh, these uh, about 100,000 cells from newborn ferrets, ventricular and outer cell ventricles all together, and gyrus and sulcus. And as you can see, we found in the order of about 30 different cell clusters. One thing that is very uh, clear and different from other uh, single cell analysis is that here clusters are actually very close to each other. They're almost contiguous, which already tells us that the distinction between the different cell clusters is not going to be super dramatic. There are going to be cells that are very similar to each other, but yet they are segregating based on their transcriptomic profile. And so we have been able to, uh, by looking at the genes that are being expressed, we have been able to ascribe identity to some of these clusters. So we have identified eight clusters with identity of radioglia cells, about uh, another eight clusters with identity of intermediate progenitor cells or uh, very immature or newborn neurons, and then another set of clusters that are clearly expressing uh, neuronal markers, post-mitotic and early differentiating neurons. Okay, so with this, we started comparing what's going on, what's different between gyrus and sulcus. And to our surprise, we found that at the level of the ventricular zone, both in the gyrus and the sulcus, we found representation of all 30 different clusters. So there was not a single cluster that would be specific uh, and, and present in one region, but not in the other. And we found the exact same situation in the OSVC, where again, we would see all clusters represented in the OSVC, both in the gyrus and the sulcus. So that tells us that the uh, genetic protomap is not caused because we have a different composition of cell types. So we went for the second possibility, which is whether uh, we have a different in the frequency of these uh, uh, cell clusters. And as you can see here, when we look in the ventricular zone, for example, and we are looking at clusters uh, identifying radioglia cells, the, uh, the uh, frequency distribution is really not dramatically different between gyrus and sulcus. There are some subtle differences, but not nearly what might, one might expect that would make such a distinction between gyrus and sulcus. And when we look at intermediate progenitor cells, pretty much the same thing. Maybe here we see one cluster that is, seems to be quite more enlarged in one region than the other, but overall the, the pattern of frequency distribution is, is very, very similar. And uh, a bit of the same story we find in the outer subventricular zone, both for radio cells and intermediate progenitor cells. So we think that the subtle differences that we may find here uh, uh, are probably very short to explaining why we have these dramatic differences in this protomap of gene expression between gyrus and sulcus. So we turn to the last possibility, which is that maybe we do have the same cell types in very similar frequencies, but uh, then they have uh, different levels of expression of a subset of their genes. And this would explain this difference, for example, here. And here's where we're finding some more positive answers, which is, for example, for PAC6, uh, expression levels between gyrus and sulcus are relatively similar in the ventricular zone, but are clearly different in the outer cell ventricular zone, much more expression in the gyrus than in the sulcus. And we have other examples of genes that maybe more clearly uh, uh, show this difference between gyrus and sulcus at the level of the outer subventricular zone, as well as in, at the level of the ventricular zone, like for example, for TBR2 or ID1. So basically with this, I've been telling you that the, uh, uh, the mechanisms of folding of the cortex that were implemented during evolution involved the formation of new germinal zones, the outer subventricular zone, the formation of new types of uh, progenitor cells, basal radioglia cells, Although mice do have basal radioglia cells, but the abundance is really, really very small in mice, and they are massively expanded in numbers in the species with a folded cortex. We, I have told you that the patterns of, uh, of cortex folding are uh, genetically imprinted, at least to some extent, by genetic protomaps, and that these are implemented uh, essentially by regulation of the expression levels of a subset of genes between population of progenitor cells that are largely similar across the territory. Okay, but so before any of this happens, before uh, the, the mode of neurogenesis has to change from direct to indirect, before these base radioglia cells have to appear and to fold the cortex, before all that in development, it's really important that these radioglia cells, first of all, they self-expand. They increase the pool of uh, neural stem and progenitor cells so that later on they can go on and perform their thing about neurogenesis and produce that full complement of neurons that is necessary to form these cortices. And so this is a question that we have been recently uh, also very intrigued about. And in fact, when one observes the size of the uh, primordium of the cortex across species, one sees that really there was also 
a very dramatic expansion, uh, particularly when we observe, for example, the human embryo. So there really are differences in the initial process of expansion of the cortical primordium. And one can imagine that this process has to be very tightly and very accurately regulated because any insult, any mishappening in this early period will have catastrophic consequences in the later development of the cortex because everything else will fall down if there is anything wrong happening here. Now, this uh, question uh, we decided that would be a good project for uh, Virginia Fernandez, a, a really fantastic student in my laboratory that is now a postdoc in Italy. Uh, and we decided to look into the possibility that maybe micronase might be regulating this uh, uh, initial expansion of the cortical primordium. Now, why micronase? Well, for several reasons. First of all, because the sequence of this micronase is quite very well conserved across species, so they're good candidates to be playing similar roles across species. There are, many of them are highly expressed in the early embryonic uh, brain. We all know that they're pleiotropics, meaning that each micronae can uh, target a number of different genes. So they are uh, very potent uh, potential regulators of gene expression and so uh, cell function. Also, there's uh, some micronase that have been identified as being primate specific, and those in particular were identified as regulating cortical progenitor cells. So it seems that evolution made some effort into using and designing new micronase to regulate cortical development. And finally, because actually there is very little known about the role of micronase in these early phases of telencephalic development. The majority of, of evidence that we have is for later stages of development, more into neurogenesis and neuronal uh, differentiation. And one of the reasons why we know little about this is because uh, for studying micronase, people usually have been using uh, mutant mice for DICER-1, which is a necessary enzyme for the maturation of micronase. And unfortunately, DICER-1 uh, knockouts are very early embryonic lethal. So to study the role of micronase in cortex development, uh, people have been using conditional knockouts. Now, unfortunately, the Cray diver lines to cross with those conditionals would recombine uh, uh, DICER not so early. And so maybe that's why uh, there is very little information in the really early events of cortex development. So what uh, Virginia did was to uh, cross the, our conditional DICER-1 knockout with a very early uh, recombiner line, which is uh, rx -Cree. And as you can see here with this uh, reporter line, um, the rx uh, is recombining really early. We see already recombination in the uh, telencephalic vesicle at E8.5. And then we continue seeing uh, recombined cells at later stages, which, uh, you know, early in cortical development, it is largely recombined in the rostral and ventral parts of the telencephalon, and later on it picks up also in the cortex. Now, when uh, Virginia looked at the phenotype of these um, uh, RX dicer knockouts, she found that already at early stages of development, there was massive uh, cell death, massive apoptosis in the rostral and ventral domains of this telencephalon, not so much in the neocortex. These massive cell deaths uh, affected mostly Pax 6 positive radioactive cells and, and not so much TBR1 positive neurons. And uh, one very intriguing observation was that this uh, massive apoptosis was quite transient. It lasted about 48 hours between E11.5 and E13.5 when this uh, rate of cell death was down to almost control levels. Now, actually, quite remarkably, this massive cell death during these 48 hours seem to have no effect on the rates of proliferation, as when we uh, looked at uh, both apical mitosis and basal mitosis, we could find no difference between mutants and controls, suggesting that probably the surviving progenitor cells are you know, trying to compensate for the loss of the dying progenitors and are overproliferating. So when we looked at the late phenotype of these uh, mutant mice, which actually they died at late embryonic stages, so we could only look at E17.5, we found that there is some maybe a reduction in the size of the cortex, but strangely, it seemed that they were lacking olfactory bulb. Now, when we looked in cross sections, we found that the olfactory bulb indeed is present, but uh, rather small. Uh, but then we realized that there was a massive disorganization in, of the germinal zones here in the uh, rostral and ventral telencephalon as compared to control animals. And when we stained for markers, for example, for progenitors in red, we found that actually there were masses of progenitor cells here highly disorganized in this domain. When we looked in detail, we found that indeed these masses of cells were constituted by uh, clear uh, proliferative rosettes. And when we analyzed the behavior of progenitor cells in these rosettes compared to the uh, normal neuroepithelium 
in the control um, cortex, we found that in these rosettes, progenitors were more highly proliferative. And in fact, they were re-entering the cell cycle much more frequently than progenitors in the normal cortex. So indeed, these progenitors were highly proliferative and producing more and more progenitors expanding these rosettes. Now we analyzed the developmental progression in the formation of these rosettes and our data supports the model in which uh, at some point there is a destabilization of the homeostasis of this ventricular zone uh, leading to the progressive invagination of the, uh, the whole layer of the ventricular zone and eventually uh, losing the attachment with the apical surface and um, finally delaminating into the parenchyma of this developing telencephalon. Importantly, during this process, there is a, a very dramatic and severe impairment of the apical adherent junctions, as you can see here, um, as labeled with the part three, um, anti part three antibodies. There is an apical adherent junction protein that this is very severely affected and that presumably is, is part of the phenotype in the delamination and detachment of these rosettes. Now we perform some transcriptomic analysis to identify which are the microRNAs involved in this and which are the messenger RNAs responsible for this phenotype. And we found indeed a number of microRNAs that are uh, dramatically downregulated in these mutants, most of which belong to the LED7 family, as you can see here. Next, we looked at the genontology terms of messenger RNAs that are targeted by these microRNAs. And this uh, um, ontology analysis revealed, uh, not surprisingly, the presence of terms like cell proliferation and cell cycle, also pathways in cancer, as well as apoptotic signaling uh, terms and related to that P53 signaling pathway. When we looked at messenger RNAs, we found in this case, as expected, a, a large number of, of RNAs that were um, overexpressed in the mutants, and these, again, when we look at, uh, at the ontology and the functional terms, we found uh, specific enrichment in terms of uh, related to neurogenesis and proliferation, as well as in response to stress and also apoptotic signaling pathways. So these transcriptomic results were uh, fully uh, you know, coherent with the phenotypes that we had observed. We have high proliferation and we have um, a lot of apoptosis and potentially cell stress due to that apoptosis. Um, so then we took these data sets and we came up with uh, an idea of how rosettes may form. And we have actually two hypotheses. One is that uh, it is known that LED7 microRNAs target several components of the P53 pathway. So in the absence or loss of LED7, this P53 pathway may be overactivated, leading to massive apoptosis, as we observed. And this somehow may lead to the formation of rosettes. Now, alternatively, we also see that one of the messenger RNAs that are highly um, overexpressed is IRS2, which again is a direct target of LED7. And IRS2 is involved in promoting proliferation and uh, changing cell adhesion. And these are definitely aspects that we also see as causing rosettes. So uh, we had two possibilities. Now, even more interestingly, it is known that the expression levels of IRS2 are promoted by uh, stress signals in the cellular environment. And obviously, these will be coming in a situation where there is massive apoptosis as we observe in the mutants. So maybe the P53 pathway could be contributing to the formation of rosettes in two ways, maybe directly through apoptosis or through the release of these stress signals that then indirectly via IRS2 might then eventually lead to the formation of rosettes. So we started testing this hypothesis. We started with P53. And first we wanted to really see if there was an increase in P activated P53 in these mutants, and as you can see here by immunostains against the activated form of P53, we see a very dramatic increase in that, suggesting that maybe uh, uh, the apoptosis uh, that we observe is indeed caused by these increased levels of P53. So to uh, rule this out, what we did was to uh, make a compound double mutant mouse uh, a conditional for both Dicer and P53, to compare what would happen with respect to the uh, rate of apoptosis. And as you can see here, this was a partially penetrant phenotype, but in all cases, we found a significant reduction in the rate of apoptosis, and in actually the majority of embryos, we found a complete rescue uh, of apoptosis where levels were completely down to uh, wild type levels. So then what happens when we look for these double mutants at more mature stages? Well, it turns out that all those uh, malformations and rosettes that we would find in the Dicer knockout were completely rescued, were not found in the double mutant for Dicer and P53, demonstrating that P53 is absolutely necessary for this rosette phenotype. 
However, because we have this possibility that this actually may not lead directly to a formation process, but only to an increase in IRS2 uh, signaling, we uh, decided also to focus and manipulate the levels of expression of IRS2. And this Virginia did by electroporation of uh, young mouse embryos, as you can see here. And what she found is that when she overexpressed IRS2 in the rostral cortex, she would find the formation of these beautiful rosettes that are really uh, similar to the ones that we found in the Dyser knockouts. So overexpression of IRS2 with uh, endogenous levels of LED7 is sufficient to induce rosettes. Now, an important question here was whether this overexpression of IRS2, um, uh, really what it does is to cause massive cell death, and then it is the apoptosis that is causing the rosettes. So we analyzed the frequency of occurrence of Chi space 3 activated uh, positive cells. And as you can see here, upon overexpression of IRS2, the amount of cells positive for Chi space 3 was really, really minimal, actually no different than in the, in the control animals at the level of the ventricular zone. There was some more in the cortical plate, but not here. And actually the ventricular zone is the layer of origin of these rosettes. So this convinced us that an increased apoptosis is not the mechanism by which these rosettes are being formed. The formation of these rosettes by overexpression of IRS2 could be completely rescued by the simultaneous also overexpression of several LED set microRNAs, as you, as you can see um, here. So LED7 overexpression on top of IRS2 overexpression was sufficient to rescue. We also wanted to know if the endogenous levels of expression of these uh, LED7 IRS2 um, were sufficient or important in the formation of these rosettes. So we blocked the endogenous uh, action of LED7 microRNAs by using a tough decoy, kind of a sponge. And this led, as you can see here, to the formation of these beautiful rosettes. So the endogenous level of LED7 are sufficient to prom promote this. And actually, we could rescue completely this phenotype of the tough decoy LED7 by simultaneously co-expressing uh, um, um, sing, um, short interfering RNA against IRS2 that would block the overexpression of IRS2. So this was fully rescuing the rosette phenotype. So essentially, what we have found is that in a control situation, the homeostasis of the ventricular neuroepithelium as it is expanding in the early embryo depends very much on the expression of LED7 microRNAs, which directly block several components of the P53 pathway and block IRS2, so that the levels of IRS2 are maintained relatively low, and, and this ensures this correct homeostasis. Now, in the Dyser knockout, we have a very dramatic loss of LED7, which then leads to the upregulation of the activity of the P53 pathway, which induces the overexpression of IRS2, which actually directly is also overexpressed by the loss of LED7. And so this leads to the overgrowth of the telencephalic neuroepithelium and to the loss of some of these dead junctions. So it's a completely unstable overgrowth uh, with the eventual formation of a massive number of rosettes, as we found in these mutants. Now, we think it is very interesting to realize that uh, there is um, uh, some type of pediatric cancer in humans called um, embryonic tumor with multilayered rosettes that uh, show this phenotype that is really reminiscent of what we find in uh, uh, our the Dyson knockout embryos. And in fact, these uh, pediatric tumors are uh, mostly diagnosed by the uh, marker expression of high levels of uh, LIN28A, which is a known blocker of LED7 action. And actually, in our Dyser 1 knockouts, we also find very high levels of expression of LIN28A, uh, suggesting that maybe some similarity between what we are observing in these Dyser knockouts and what's happening in this type of human pediatric tumors. So essentially, and to wrap up, um, uh, what I've shown you this afternoon is that uh, when it comes to neurogenesis in the reptiles in the early and, and, and maybe less elaborate amniotes, uh, neurogenesis occurs essentially in a direct mode from radially cells consuming to produce neurons. And this is because they, uh, these progenitor cells are expressing high levels of robo. Now, during evolution, there was a gradual decrease in the expression levels of robo in these progenitor cells. And this allowed the formation of intermediate progenitors forming a subventricular zone. And this led to the formation of much greater numbers of cortical neurons, and so the expansion of cortex size. Now, subsequently, there were other genes uh, uh, modified in their expression levels, and I've talked about TRIP1 and FLIRT1 and 3, uh, the dam regulation of which allowed the further expansion of the uh, subventricular zone, uh, even the formation of the outer subventricular zone, and the occurrence of new types of basal progenitors, namely basal radiative cells, 
that contributed not only to a yet greater increase in the numbers of cortical neurons, but also to an increase in the surface area of the cortex and to the formation of falls and fissures. And in particular, I've shown you that by establishing a specific patterns of high or low expression levels across these germinal layers, this then was a mechanism to instruct to implement what will be the eventual pattern of cortex folding in this uh, very much developed species. And finally, I've shown you that micronase are very important regulators of the early uh, development of uh, uh, telencephalic neuroepithelium in making sure that these progenitor cells can expand and self-amplify sufficiently, but without uh, overgrowing too much into causing uh, pathological situations like brain tumors that may occur in patients. So that's all. I hope that I convince you that the evolution of the uh, size and folding of the cerebral cortex across amniotes, and particularly also in mammals, was the result of the relation of uh, levels and patterns of expression of genes and signaling pathways that otherwise are very conserved across all these species. Finally, I just want to uh, acknowledge again the multiple collaborators that have been helping us over the years in all these projects. And of course, I must mention the people who actually did the work, and I hope I didn't forget any one of these people that are here indicated in green that did much of the work. And unfortunately, Virginia is not with us anymore, who is, as I said, an our postdoc in Davide de Pietri Tonelli's lab. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Victor for this wonderful talk. We do have a large number of questions, which I will ask you uh, in the order in which they were, uh, received. well, no, voted, I not really received. Um, okay. so, uh, and before I do that, and we still have the audience uh, all of it with us, I just wanted to make a quick plug-in uh, for the fact that at work we're looking at uh, we're looking for young science students postdocs who are willing to give three to five minute talks um, before the main the main talk. So if you're if you're interested in that, uh, please please send an email. I will type, I will um, paste the email in the in the chat box and send an email to the. I will I will send share the, your students and postdocs if they're interested in. In giving these shorts before for the main talk. Okay, to the, the questions. The first uh, question is from uh, Ben Berninger, um, who asks, could you get the olfactory bulb folded by favor indirect neurogenesis? Yeah, that's a very interesting question because actually uh, originally we were intrigued about the olfactory bulb because we thought that, that could be a cool system to study cortex folding in the uh, mouse. It turns out that it's not quite the same thing, but uh, that's why I find it uh, so interesting that Benedict is asking this. Um, well, so um, it's hard to say, no, because for uh, what we have been learning over the years is that folding uh, involves um, essentially the presence of basal radiaglia cells. So what one would want is to uh, promote not just that indirect neurogenesis in the olfactory bulb, but maybe the formation of uh, a greater number of these basal radiaglia cells. And so, uh, of course, now we know some tricks, some genetic manipulations that one can do to promote the formation of these basal radiaglia cells. So it might be uh, a cool thing to try and see in the olfactory bulb. Unfortunately, the territory that gives rise to the olfactory bulb itself is quite small. So I don't know really how much room there's going to be to make uh, some folds there. But uh, uh, sure, there's something that, that's something that we can try. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Esther Kutler, um, who is asking, what if you compare the neocortex with the prefrontal cortex in of indirect, uh, direct versus indirect neurons? Yes, this is something that, this is something that we have also asked ourselves, um, because obviously of the, of the similarity and, and the prefrontal cortex also being part of that paleocortex, no? Um, we have been working a little bit on that. Uh, however, it is uh, somewhat difficult because one uh, is, is a bit limited to going to really early stages because as soon as the telencephalon starts to grow, the germinal zones that give rise to the piriform cortex uh, get a little hidden in the very lateral part of the, of the ventricular cavity. And there, you know, it's a little hard to really trace uh, 
uh, which domain of progenitors will give rise to the piriform cortex and which will already be giving rise to the neocortex. But if I had to speculate, of course, I would expect that in the piriform cortex, which also is missing some of the six layers of the neocortex, I would expect to uh, maybe see a lower degree or lower incidence of indirect neurogenesis. Maybe not as low as, um, as in the olfactory bulb, but uh, probably something in between. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is from uh, Denis uh, Jabodon, who's asking, is there evidence the intermediate genifers, like the ones born around E13, have higher proliferative capacity than the later born intermediate progenitors, um, which divide one twice? Yeah. Um, so do you think there are, these are different, uh, different subpopulations of intermediate progenitors? Yeah, so as far as I know, and I, I could be completely ignorant with this, um, I don't think that there is any evidence that uh, of the proliferative capacity of intermediate progenitors uh, cells early versus late. Um, of course, uh, the early intermediate progenitors have more time to self-amplify and to keep dividing just because there is more still time to come for neurogenesis, whereas the late the stage intermediate progenitors just have a few days to, to end up what they want to do. No? But of course, that's no, no, no thing to say that they actually do divide more than the others. Um, and I would really love to see that, that if these exist, one could distinguish them, um, hopefully maybe by single cell transcriptomics. No, but we were discussing before with Basem that probably is impossible to uh, reach that conclusion definitely just by looking at the transcription profiles because all these cell clusters are so similar. They sit so close together that um, at least I don't see how we can um, uh, you know, definitely say that they are irreversibly separate and following completely um, separate lineages. No, uh, so I think uh, there is still lots more work to do, and probably um, experimental manipulations of whatever we find. Now that we found all these different clusters, both in mouse and, and in ferret, one has to find the ways of manipulating selectively um, specific clusters, one and not another, and see what comes out. No, but so far is I think it's, it's too early to say. Okay, um, and then we, uh, Isabel Martin Garay is asking what are the different levels of robo and beta um, proteins in cells intrinsically regulated? Uh, is, is this sort of you know, evolution of non code sequence, for example, that, that makes the expression level change and rate in different species? Or is this, is this essentially a response to extracellular signaling, say, being events? Or, Know, potential pigeons or whatever. Yeah, this is the question that we also uh, have been thinking a lot about because, in particular, me being completely from outside of the notch field, I was very puzzled by the fact that we could find this territory of the primordial of the olfactory bulb uh, with uh, very low levels of delta expression. Because, as far as I could understand, if a cell is expressing low uh, delta, it will not activate the notch pathway on the neighbor cell, and so the neighbor cell will activate delta. Um, so it was super puzzling to not see a, a salt and pepper pattern in the olfactory bulb primordium, uh, both for delta and as well for HES, because I haven't shown, but for HES1 is very uh, lowly expressed also in this olfactory bulb. Um, so that uh, makes me think that maybe it's not so much solely that the, the, uh, there is a, a cell extrinsic way or, or cell, cell cell communication mechanism into defining that uh, delta levels are going to be low because uh, I insist, based on, on the classical mechanism by which this works, um, uh, we should be seeing cells with high expression as well as cells with low expression. Also, I, I am inclined to say that there's probably cell intrinsic mechanisms uh, regulating this. And as far as we have been able to tell, it seems that Robo may be a very high in the hierarchy of this genetic regulation because uh, all the genes that I'm talking about uh, change their level of expression completely in uh, Robo 1 and 2 mutants, no? which indicated that as long as you have the rob receptor or when you lose it, uh, that is going to change completely. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's true. Um, so Fernando Alcina is asking, is the branching integrating neuron correlation or consequent folding? If you would force folding in the cortex of a lysencephalic species, degree of branching neuron uh, change. So is it chicken or egg? Yes, that's right. I think that's exactly what you said. It's a chicken or egg uh, uh, question, and uh, and yes, we just have to do the experiment. No, what uh, 
something that somebody asked me is a while ago related to this point, uh, which um, we're in the process of examining, is whether in fissures, not in falls in the in the ferret, but in, in fissures where the surface of the cortex does not expand so much, and so presumably the trajectory of migration is much more parallel, if there we also find branching of these uh, migrating cells. And uh, this, as I said, uh, we're in the process of looking, but I think that's, that's maybe another way of looking at this question. But uh, um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think uh, we need to do some experiments, maybe both in the ferret and in the mouse, and examine whether that, uh, that um, changes. No, but at least um, what we do know is that both in lysencephalic species like the mouse and in genencephalic species like the ferret, um, these branched uh, uh, migrating neurons exist. So I, I'm always a, a defendant of the idea that if a mechanism exists, you can exploit it, you can make it more or less um, in some way. Um, so I would not be surprised that we can change this morphology and behavior of migrating rounds in either case. So we still have quite a few questions. Um, how with this, Victor, you're okay? Uh, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm uh, here for this, so go ahead. Okay, wonderful. So the next question is from Sarah Bissolo, who is asking, have you ever checked how far a neuron can travel tangentially by jumping between fibers? Yes, well, we have not um, imaged this jumping of cells for a long time, just because these are uh, events that take a long time and it's not so easy to keep imaging under the microscope for many days. Uh, but in vivo, in our earlier descriptions of, of um, cortex folding in the ferret, we did find by making very local, very small injections of retroviruses in vivo in the developing ferret, we would see that neurons born from this little domain of retrovirally infected cells, they would end up located really very distant in the cortex. And I think we measured up to 16 millimeters in cortical surface, we would find uh, pyramidal cells uh, uh, as distant as that, no? And I insist the injection site might be as small as 300 microns. So I think that this, uh, this mechanism of, of uh, migration uh, can really take these cells quite far away in the lateral way. Um, that is to say how much they really need to go, because obviously when these neurons migrate, they're not alone. There's many other neurons migrating and also, uh, you know, trying to move sideways. Um, and I think that's a very interesting and important question to really find out how much a, an individual neuron will move laterally or have a net displacement in the end, uh, um, even though they may be able to move very much, but really how much they will end up moving and how much uh, parallel clones may uh, intercross. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Anna Uskian, who's asking, um, how does the uh, basal radiotranscriptome uh, correlate with the human basal radiotranscriptome? Yeah, I should have told Anna to ask me questions in private because she always is asking very hard questions. Um, I have no idea. We are we are yet uh, still, as I said, this is an ongoing project in the lab, and Lucia is working as hard as one can work. Um, um, but that's definitely in our pipeline to to compare the transcriptomes, not only of basal radiolia cells, but also of all the other types of progenitor cells and, and different uh, varieties of, of cells that we're finding in these individual germinal layers. The the problem is that, um, and, and this maybe I should comment here, um, that only because we have been able to do our single cell analysis in micro dissected germinal layers, we know where we're looking at. And it turns out that, as I said, uh, we find uh, the same clusters of cells uh, that we find in the ventricular zone as we find in the outer subventricular zone. And these are very different, very separate layers. So we're sure we don't have contamination between one and the other. And yet we find the same cluster. We have clusters that, based on transcriptomic uh, profiles, one would ascribe as basal radiolia cells. And these we find in the OSVZ as well as in the ventricular zone. And the same for apical radiolia cells. We see genetic profiles or transcriptomic profiles giving us the identity that everybody uses as saying, oh, these are apical radiolia cells. Well, we find these also in the outer subventricular zone. So we are kind of reinterpreting what really means these transcriptional profiles when ascribing cell identities. And unfortunately, uh, so far, we are the only ones that I know that have been uh, doing this analysis by looking at only one terminal layer. Uh, most people are you know, smooshing the whole cortex and then only separating cell types based on the transcriptomic profile. And maybe uh, we should be more refined than that. Yeah, that, that I don't, instinctively makes a lot of sense. Um, so, um, 
is asking, have you thought about performing on a velocity analysis to complement the, um, the uh, uh, you know, Disney plot analysis? Uh, because uh, he suggests that this could reveal separate change directions of different rate of Yes, yes, of course, we are looking into all possible tools that exist out there that we can use for doing this analysis. And uh, we just uh, uh, started using um, the other method and velocity, of course, will be informative and maybe uh, I'm not sure how um, it will give us clearly the direction of the lineage, but I'm not sure um, uh, at what level of resolution uh, of these lineages, how well we can separate one lineage from the other. Maybe we can analyze each lineage separately and then look at the direction of the lineage uh, using velocity. Basem, are you there? So, sorry, I'm muted. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jordan P is asking, can you speculate as why there is no effect in the cortex in our dicer chaos? Yes, that's uh, again a very good question. And uh, actually, maybe Giordano was a reviewer of our paper. Um, um, and in fact, what we find, so initially we thought that this was merely because uh, uh, clear combination with the RX uh, driver is uh, much more early in the rostral part of the telencephalon than in the neocortex. And actually, in the neocortex, it's not uh, complete even at late stages. Uh, so we thought it was a question of that. But in fact, when we started doing these electroporations to manipulate IRS2, uh, we realized that actually iris 2 can only induce the formation of rosettes in the rostral cortex. And no matter how caudal we electroporate it, or sometimes we electroporate the entire cortex from very rostral to caudal, and only the very rostral part of the cortex was affected. Um, so I guess that uh, we have to think that there's uh, different uh, molecular mechanisms that ensure this homeostasis of the telencephalic uh, neuropithelium that uh, maybe LED7 and iris 2 are only responsible or, or specifically implemented for the more rostral part, which interestingly, no, that makes us think of the prefrontal cortex and, and the, the later, uh, uh, later expanded part of the cortex in evolution. Uh, if there is a particular uh, uh, susceptibility to disruption of that part of the cortex, but lead, uh, really the rest of the cortex, uh, we did not find any defects. Um, so I'm suspecting that um, uh, Maybe it's a combination of that not so much micronasal change in the caudal cortex of these uh, dicer knockouts, and maybe that it, it could be a completely different mechanism that is uh, guarding the homeostasis back there. So Benedict is asking uh, the the many rosettes. It's a good one. Rosettes and dicer KO remind me remind him of organoids. Um, uh, could you do you think that there's a shared mechanism between how? or make their results and what's happening in, in this nature KO? Well, um, uh, to begin with, in organoids, uh, things are much more loose than in a, in a normally developing cortex, meaning that uh, probably the adherent uh, junctions uh, belt is uh, not as well established and there is no, you know, hydraulic pressure. We have no meninges, we have no bone to keep uh, the tissue there. And so basically the ventricles that form in an organoid at least that's my idea about this, uh, it's just by self-assembly. And we have known for many decades that people have been studying uh, neuroepithelial cells uh, on a dish in two dimensions because uh, they were forming rosettes and they would uh, study their properties by this formation of rosettes. So I think that rosette formation is just maybe uh, uh, mechanically or uh, you know, thermodynamically more stable configuration that cells that are self-organizing uh, may have a greater tendency to to form. Um, so I'm not sure if we can really extrapolate what we have found in the formation of these rosettes, which is disruption of a system that is seemingly quite stable uh, into becoming unstable. Uh, maybe in the organoids, the situation is already, uh, to start with, not really very stable. No, exactly. No, it makes sense. So Debbie Silver is asking, is there, is there evidence of map enhanced driving salsa and gyra in expression patterns? Yes, of course, that's a super interesting question. And um, I don't have an answer for that, but it's a, a question that we're actually currently pursuing. Uh, we started looking at uh, epigenetics and probably will continue with uh, also chromatin availability and to try to identify which are the, the 
regulatory mechanisms that are differently activated or differently present in Jairi and Solsei that may drive these differences in transcriptomic levels. But unfortunately, the I don't have uh, much of uh, concrete information to tell you. Maybe we should look into some of your accelerated regions if, if they are somehow uh, a primitive version of those are already implemented in the fact. Okay, and then we have a question from Elisa Murenu. Can the olfactory be considered old in itself? Uh, Neuroblasts do have four branches, one inside the olfactory bulb, and great radial at the end of their journey, although no actual radial fiber is present at adult stages. Okay, Vasel, I'm sorry, but your, your voice was cutting there and I got half of your words. Could you repeat that? Um, hear me now? Uh, maybe. maybe. Okay. Oh, I can, I can read the question now. Okay. Okay. You can read the question? Yes. Okay. Okay, I don't know if these are two separate questions. Um, or maybe related to the fact that we would expect uh, neurons to, migrate neurons to have branches in the olfactory bulb as they migrate out. Well, actually, so uh, related to this question, if you can keep it, then I can keep reading it. Uh, in the olfactory bulb, there are radial fibers, of course. There's radial glia cells, there are the primary progenitor cells there as well. And actually, I didn't show today, but we have been looking at the disposition of these uh, basal processes of radial fibers, and in the olfactory bulb, they are kind of uh, having this similar disposition as in false. So I would argue that maybe also in the olfactory world, we are going to find uh, a branch leading process of the migrating neurons. Uh, we just have not been looking at that in, in so much uh, detail. Um, so in that respect, and, and this is linked again to the question of Benedict, uh, one could, uh, to a certain extent, consider that the olfactory world is some, uh, somehow, or for some aspects of its development, uh, some kind of a fault of the, of the ancient cortex. So the next question is from Ada Almacela. So he's asking, uh, the embryos with increased direct neurogenesis, when you induce the increase in direct neurogenesis, were they viable and did they have any behavioral problems? Yes, these were viable. Um, however, I must say that, uh, of course, we thought about the uh, behavioral phenotype because uh, we had a loss of superficial layers and a gain in, in, in deep layers, and we would definitely expect some kind of a, of a behavioral phenotype. Um, unfortunately, these experiments, the way they're done by a neutral electroporation, the amount of cells that are being changed with respect to the total cells in the cortex is very small. Yeah, even if one goes with a very massive electroporation, uh, we're targeting what? Maybe uh, one, five, ten percent of the cells. So uh, the vast majority of the cortex would still be normal. And so I would not really expect much of a phenotype. What we wanted to do in this project, which in the end it didn't work out, was to generate a, 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 some kind of a transgenic or a mutant mouse where we could um, make the same types of, of genetic changes, but uh, stably, uh, so that we could target all the cortical cells and then have the whole cortex eventually uh, be formed by only direct neurogenesis and see first if we dramatically change the size of this cortex and second, obviously, according to this question, to see if that would have uh, uh, an important uh, behavioral phenotype. Uh, so, so I kind of have a related, but I mean, not exactly, but uh, and about the. So, you know, one of the surprising things is, as you mentioned a bit about the the levels of the changes in uh, expression, right, in versus in uh, neurogenesis, um, and it, so. One question is when you when you look at or induce you either look at species that have more neurogenesis or you induce it yourself, do you actually see an increase in neurogenin two levels within the Pax SOX2 of positive cells in the ventricular zone? So do do you actually turn up proneuroprotein in the glia themselves? Um, and, and so they, in a way, act both as radial glia and intergenitors. They now express high levels of, of neuroproteins. Something yeah. you observed or looked at? Yes. So, no, we have not been specifically looking at this, but uh, um, yes, at some point we wondered whether we would have changes in the expression of neurogenin when we were manipulating the rates of neurogenesis in the cortex or in the olfactory world. Uh, 
And uh, very strikingly, we were observing uh, quite the opposite from what you're saying. It turns out that the, the olfactory bulb neurogenin, for example, I think it was neurogenin 2 maybe that we looked at by in situ looking at RNA, uh, it is uh, quite low, if I'm not mistaken, quite low in the olfactory bulb. And we were expecting actually the opposite. No, there is more neurogenesis at early stages. We would expect to see more of this neurogenin. And that's not what we found. Of course, there is many neurogenic genes that may be responsible and taking up the function in the olfactory world as compared to the cortex. Um, so maybe we should be looking at the cortex as you're, as you're suggesting, no? And that's something that we have not done. Um, and I would have suspected that this to happen, no? I think it's interesting to see how much really we can change these uh, apical radiglia cells into becoming uh, not just more neurogenic, but closer to the neuronal phenotype. Yes, that was my whether radial glia helped more of intermediate projectors so they're this mixed cell type that can you know more prone to to, to genesis than it is to self renew but, uh, yeah anyway, yeah maybe i, I, the I cortex. also comment here that uh one observation that we made some time ago that i thought was very intriguing is that in the cortex in intermediate progenitor cells we stained you know, for TBR2, which is a typical marker, and we also stain for TUH1 to see neurons. And then we realized that some of the mitosis of these intermediate progenitors, which obviously they have tubule in there in the mitotic spindle, we would see this mitotic spindle be uh, stained with a, a beta C tubulin, which is supposed to be really neuron specific. And we were already seeing this uh, neuronal tubulin in the mitotic spindle of these intermediate progenitors. I interpreted that as, a, as the earliest sign that the daughter cells of this division would become neurons that were already making some of the neuronal specific proteins super early, even at mitosis. So um, I guess we could look for a similar signs in the radioglia that we have been inducing direct neurogenesis to see if we already see some of these signs of early uh, neuronal differentiation. Okay, and the last question we have is from Dede Pietro Telli, who's uh, saying, Victor, I curiosity uh, how is the let7 fam mouse uh, are any of the let7 members more expressed than others in the mouse what about human where the let7 family counts many more members than in the mouse so is there redundancies basically between let7 members yeah yeah, yeah. well definitely the, the, there's multiple members of the let7 family expressed in the in the mouse uh, cortex and indeed, as I showed in the talk, uh, we found um, like uh, eight or 10 of those being done regulated. Not all were done regulated similarly. So uh, the levels of, of expression and change in expression were different. Uh, and just because there are multiple of them, uh, one could think that they are uh, somewhat redundant. And in fact, the, the rescue experiment that we did by overexpressing LED7 on top of overexpressing uh, IRS2, we, not, we did not express all let sevens we we express let seven a b and c but there's many others there's g h a um, i and, and so we just focus on those three and those were sufficient to rescue this phenotype so i would imagine that uh, um, that they do have some uh, degree of redundancy in their function now how that compares to human i'm afraid that davide is much more expert in micronase than myself and uh, th these i cannot answer i don't know Okay, that concludes the question and answer session. We have no more questions. We will through them all. Thank you very much for your patience and graciousness. It was, uh, uh, it was a, an absolutely beautiful talk and a tour de force of excellent work. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you for hosting. Uh, it's a pleasure. My apologies to everyone for the technical hit, but we got through it. And see you again soon on the virtual world in the hope that sooner or later we get back to the world. Okay, thank you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.